Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. Here it is, almost Christmas, and what a holiday season it is. Happier than we've had for some time because this year more people are able to enjoy more of the good things of life. At this time of year, the true Christmas spirit permeates our hearts and is reflected by those with whom we come in contact. In many cases, this spirit finds expression in Christmas gifts, and every holiday season brings us new things, gifts that are even more beautiful and more serviceable than those of previous years. Few of us are likely to pause and reflect about it, but the science of chemistry plays a large part in this yearly progress. In your Christmas stocking or under your tree will be packages gay with their colorful, sparkling cellulose wrappings made possible by chemistry. Many a package will contain something that the research chemist either helped to improve or actually created. On your holiday table will be fruits, candies, and foods that reached you in perfect condition thanks to better refrigeration and speedier transportation, in both of which chemistry plays an important part. The car you drive, the home in which you live, the very clothes you wear, have all been improved by research chemistry. On behalf of the DuPont people throughout the nation, whose objectives are well expressed in the phrase, better things for better living through chemistry, I take this opportunity to wish you a merry, merry Christmas. This evening, the Cavalcade of America pays tribute to one of the most beloved women of all time, Madame Ernestine schumann Hank, a great artist and a great humanitarian. The part of Madame schumann Hank will be sung by Helen Olheim, prima donna contralto of the Metropolitan Opera Company, and played by Jeanette Nolan. The orchestra is under the direction of Don Voorhees. Although born in Prague, Austria-Hungary, Madame schumann Hank became an American citizen and adopted America as her own land. The discovery that young Ernestine Roessler had been endowed with a remarkable voice came while the young girl was a student in the Ursuline Convent in Prague. In 1877, when she was 16 years of age, her first great opportunity came. The famous tenor Labat, impressed with her voice, arranged an appointment for her to sing for the director of the Imperial Opera in Vienna. Ernestine is talking nervously with Labatt in the wings of the great stage of the Imperial Opera. I see shivers run up and down my back, Labatt. I'm so frightened. Oh, you will sing, child, when you hear the first parts played by the orchestra. Aren't you must sing well? It is a real opportunity. Yeah, my heart is filled with gratitude to you, Herr Labatt. But there is something not right. See, all these fine ladies of opera look at me so strangely. They smile. My dress is not of silk like theirs. Oh, the eternal feminine. Forget your dress, child. It is the voice, and the voice alone that matters. A great director like Herr Zauner will not notice your gown. Yet, if I had thought, I would have suggested a new one. But then I couldn't have come to Vienna. My father has a large family to support with only a major pay. It was his friend, the rich field marshal Benedict, who gave me his devotion for the journey. Never could I have bought a silk dress, too. Oh, it will not matter. Ah, the director signals. Courage, child. Forget this great opera house. Forget everything and sing from your heart. After your song is ended, you shall talk with the director. Hannibal, my throat is dry. Oh, I wish I was safe at home. I cannot sing. The music, Ernestine. The drinking song from Lucretia Borgia. It is your cue. Oh, <laughs> 
Oh, you sang like an angel, Ernestine. Come, we shall hear his verdict. Herr Director, I wish to present to you Fräulein Ernestine Rössler. Well, does she wish the truth, Herr Labatt? Yeah, yeah, Herr Director. The truth of my voice, I beg of you. Surely, Herr Director, you feel as I do, that her voice holds great promise. Promise? Perhaps. But why do you bring her to me? Why bring such a girl to the Imperial Opera in Vienna? You waste my time. The time of my orchestra. Surely, Surely you cannot mean... Look at her. Such clothes, such poverty. She has nothing. What can I do for such a homely girl? What do you expect? Homely? Yeah. It's true, I am homely. I didn't think of that before. Yeah, we do have poverty at home. No money for fine dresses. But my voice... I thought my voice... No, 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 dear child. Go home, quick. Go home and ask your kind friends who gave you money to come to Vienna to do for you one more favor. Tell them to buy you a sewing machine and learn to be a dressmaker, maybe, or something like that. But a singer? Huh? An opera singer? Never. Never in this world. <laughs> But within a few months, the second opportunity came. Ernestine Roessler was invited to sing for the director of the Dresden Royal Opera. And this time, she was engaged at a small salary. Then followed years of hard work, singing small parts, first in Dresden and then in Hamburg. Next, her marriage to Hank, the birth of her first four children, the difficulty her husband had to support his family, and then the difference in their temperaments, their agreement to separate. And the prospect of a leading operatic role was growing dimmer with every passing year. For the prima donna of the Hamburg opera, Madame Goethe, was a contralto like Ernestine Heinck and a bitter rival of her young potential competitor. One night at the Hamburg opera, a half hour before the curtain was to rise on Carmen, with Ernestine singing the small part in Mercedes, her friend and fellow singer Marie Kaur burst excitedly into the dressing room. Ernestine! Ernestine! Have you heard? Marie, you red in the face. Have I heard what? Oh, such confusion. Such a battle. Our high and mighty prima donna has had another quarrel with Paulini. And she has this minute left the opera house. No, and it means nothing. She will come back. She always thought. No, yeah, this time it seems serious. And who will sing Carmen? I tell you, she will come back. Each scene like this is Paulini. He enjoys. He admires her temperament. Gives her another advance in pay. Yeah, but Ernestine, Paulini was truly in a rage. And she has gone, I tell you. And I tell you, she will come back. Marie, you and I make a great mistake not flying into those rages like her. I myself have many faults. First, I am homely. Uh, not homely, Ernest. Yeah, homely. They told me that years ago. And second, I learn all the parts like a goose. Big parts and little parts I learn. I shall be an old lady before I ever sing a big part. And the biggest fault of all... I do not tear the hair of everybody in the opera. A prima donna must do that, it seems. Enter. Ernestine, it is the director. Herr Pauline. Hank, Hank, can you sing Carmen? Carmen, did you say Herr Director? Yeah. But certainly. Can you sing Carmen tonight, in half an hour, I mean? Tonight? Oh, yeah, tonight or any other night, Herr Director. Did you ever study Carmen? With my teacher when I was a girl, I studied it by ear. By ear, did you say? But I have watched every Carmen, Herr Director. I tell you, I shall sing Carmen tonight, or I shall die on that stage. Such trouble. Well, make ready, Hank. Make ready. Find the costume. There's no one else. You must sing it. My anger with Gertrude was so great, I told you, you could sing it as well as she. I promise you, I shall sing it, so that even you will be beat. Do you think I have waited all these years for my chance, only to disgrace myself? Nine, nine. Have no fear. Well, you have less than half an hour to make ready, Hank. And I have less than half an hour... To be the laughing stock of all Hamburg. In borrowed clothes, a skirt too long, shoes too tight, Ernestine Hank sang Carmen for the first time and without a single rehearsal. In the wings, the director, Polini waited for the verdict of the audience and shuddered. And in the opera house, music lovers, devotees of the prima donna Goethe, waited for the habanera and doubted. Ernestine Heinck, remembering desperately the performances of all the Carmen she had ever seen, sings. Thank <laughs> you. 
That last-minute substitution in the role of Carmen proved a turning point in Ernestine Heinz's career. She soon became one of Germany's leading soloists. And in 1896, when she was 35 years of age, she reached what she believed to be the pinnacle of her career. She was engaged by Cosima Wagner, widow of Richard Wagner, to sing the leading contralto roles at the Wagnerian festivals in Bayreuth. Her fame was now assured throughout Europe. The next season, while she was singing in Vienna, there occurred an incident which schumann Heinck was to chase to the last day of her life. Now the concert in Vienna has reached its close. The audience has been shouting for an encore, and now the great contralto appears again on the stage. She signals for silence. I receive great good news, the greatest honor ever paid to me. There is seated here in this opera house, in this very first row, one of the few great composers of our day. And I am so proud. He has come tonight to hear me sing. He is your friend, my friend. A friend to all the world. He is Johannes Brahms. <laughs> Not many years ago in Hamburg, when I was an unknown contralto, this generous and great musician heard me sing. And he was ah so warm in his praise, so kind. My heart is filled to overflowing this night. Because he is here. I will sing for you now and for him his most beautiful song. A song with which I lull to sleep my blessed baby. shall depart in peace. Tonight, I have heard my lullaby sung as I always dreamed it should be sung. Dear Heinz, will you sing it after I am gone so the world will not forget me and my music too quickly? Meister, believe me, Herr Brahms, 
while there remains in this world a mother, and while there is alive on this earth a singer, your lullaby will live in the hearts of men and women. In 1898, Schumann Heinck signed a contract with Maurice Grau, impresario of the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and with her second husband, the actor-manager Paul Schumann, she set sail for the New World, America. On November 7, 1898, Chicago, the American debut of Schumann Heinck singing Ortrude in Wagner's opera Lohengrin. The final aria... and brings tears to my foolish eyes. See, Paul, you shouldn't like our little Lotta. Yeah. Who is Lottie, Madame Schumann? My darling little girl who's with her grossmutter in Germany. Well, my daddy told me to stay only one minute. Good night, Madame Schumann. Good night, and God bless you, my child. Half the city of Chicago wants to congratulate you. Are you too tired? Shall I send them over? Nein, nein, I'm never too tired. I wish I might clasp the hand of every man, woman, child in America. 
I feel deep down in my heart, Herr Grau, that every American is my friend. Ah, I will love America. <laughs> Madam Schumann Hank's youngest child was born four weeks after that triumphant Chicago debut. In New York City, a month later, Paul Schumann tiptoes into the sitting room of their hotel suite. His wife, the great prima donna, is rocking contentedly while she loves her baby to sleep. He sleeps with a smile on his sweet face. Yeah. It is as I told Red Johannes Bram at the time in Vienna. This lullaby belongs to every age and to the babies of all nations. An immortal melody. Yeah. Our little American baby loves Bram just like my other darling German baby. Our American baby? <laughs> Wouldn't I think we had adopted our child in this country? Up a nine pounds. I have adopted America. The day I stepped from the boat, I felt I had come home. And Paul, now at last I have the name for our baby. Oh, I am glad. Such worry over a name. You have not slept for nights thinking about it, Timmy. We shall name him George Washington. George Washington? Yeah. Do you not agree? George Washington Schumann. Our American baby shall have the name of the first great American president. It is fitting that it be so. And I shall be American forever. This is my land. But, Paul, when I rock to sleep my little George Washington, he shall hear always the lullaby of the great Brown. Music is international. Like a mother's love, it speaks every language. Madame Schumann Hank was recognized everywhere America, Europe, the Orient, as the world's formal Wagnerian contralto. But to the American people, there are two simple songs which will always be identified with her name. One is Brahms' beautiful lullaby, the other is equally beloved. Schumann Hank's presentation of this song has become one of the most cherished traditions of radio. On each Christmas Eve, Mother Schumann Hank sang this song. Those who heard her will never forget the vibrant warmth of her voice. They felt her genuine love and sympathy for all mankind as she sang the beautiful Silent Night. The Cavalcade of America salutes the memory of a great artist. Next week at the same time, DuPont will again present The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Mm-hmm.